Well, about six or seven years ago, I had this big desire to want to be able to play the guitar. And I thought, how cool would it be if I could just get out the guitar at home and play songs that I like to hear on the radio or play some worship songs and just kind of enhance my worship time with God? Or how great would it be uh, we love having campfires in our backyard and, and just having a guitar around the campfire or leading my family in worship? Uh, I would love to be able to do that. So I told Amy about this, and she surprised me for one of my birthdays and found this great little starter guitar and, and some books to kind of teach me how to learn. And so I was so excited when I opened that up, and I got it out, and I just started trying to learn all these fingerings for these different chords and trying to learn how to do a strum pattern. And, of course, I wanted to be able to sing along to the songs, so I was trying to do all that, and I realized pretty quickly, that's challenging. It's hard trying to pick up a new instrument. And I've got a musical background, but learning the guitar, I mean, it takes work. And uh, so I really had a challenge with it and ended up just kind of putting the, the guitar in the back closet for a while and forgot about it. And about a year and a half ago, I was watching the TV show Shark Tank. Do we have any Shark Tank fans? So Shark Tank is this TV show where uh, people will go on and pitch an idea or a product or a service that they want to launch or kind of take to the next level, and they share this idea with the sharks who are investors, and if they like your idea, they'll invest in you and help you kind of get to that next level. And I was watching it one afternoon, and I saw this guy come on, and he had this thing he called Chord Buddy. And what Chord Buddy is, it's this little device that you hook onto your guitar, and it has buttons that you push, and they're color-coded. So there's a red, yellow, blue, and green button, and when you push it down, it uh, does like the fingering for you, so you can just push that, and you don't have to worry about trying to do these weird things with your fingers, and you can start playing right away. So it's really cool. And it comes with this book with all the chords in there, and, and they're all color-coded. So you just start playing and just push a little button. And as you learn and you get really comfortable playing, you start removing these brackets. So one at a time, you do learn the fingering, and then you take another one out. And before, the idea is that after a while, you can actually play the guitar. So I got Chord Buddy. It arrived in the mail. I was super pumped. I hooked that thing up, and, and I could play right away, pushing the buttons. So I, what I would do is I would just go around the house, and I would put on these little mini concerts. I'd find my family, and I'd be like, you got to listen to this song. you got to listen to it. And so the first song I learned was Let It Be by the Beatles. And I played that song over and over and over. And before long, like, you would hear one guitar strum on my guitar, and the house would be empty. Like, Everybody would disappear. And I'd go try to, I'd track down the kids. I'd say, Jake, you got to hear this new song. And Jake would be like, Dad, I, I got to go mow the lawn. This lawn's not going to mow itself, <laughs> right? And I'd find Hannah, and she'd, like, she'd be like, Dad, I got I to test the study for in two months. You know, you can never work too far ahead. <laughs> so my concerts kind of went by the wayside. Uh, and I... I even told Ben, I said, you've got, if you've got a song with these four chords in it, put me on the worship team. I'm in. So I'm still waiting for him to call me up. But, but what I thought was, I wish I had picked up the guitar when I was younger. I know some of the kids in our kids' ministry who are learning guitar right now, and they're picking it up like that. They're like way better than I am with Chord Buddy. I'm so jealous. And I thought, man, if I had only learned the guitar when I was young, I'd be so much better. And the same is true with sports. It's true with music. It's true with learning new languages. We get kids on sports team, like as soon as they can walk, we get them out on the field and they're running around in chaos, but they learn things and they pick it up so quickly. So these things are true in all these areas of our life. What does it look like in our spiritual life? I want to ask you a question this morning. What if you had learned to hear God's voice earlier in your life? What kind of impact would that make in your spiritual walk? Now, I know for a lot of us, the regrets that we have in our life are based on decisions that we made. 
Maybe we didn't make the right choice. When we look back, oftentimes it comes down to something that we chose that didn't go like what we thought. What if we were able to better hear God's voice in those moments? Can you imagine what that would look like? Well, we're going to look at a scripture passage this morning in Samuel. And Samuel, quite honestly, hears, hears God's voice in a way that would make a lot of us jealous. I would love to hear God's voice in an audible way, the way Samuel did. And it's amazing how God uses this boy. So I want to give you a little bit of background about this passage before we look at the text. So first of all, if you've ever been here on a Sunday morning when we've done child dedications, you're familiar with part of this story because our child dedications are based off of 1 Samuel with Hannah. And Hannah is Samuel's mom. And it starts with her as her family would travel every year to the city of Shiloh to the tabernacle. And that's where the ark of God was held. So they would travel here to the tabernacle and they would offer sacrifices and they would give their worship to God there. And Hannah was unable to have children. And so she prays like this gut-wrenching, just passionate prayer before God, asking him to bless her with a child. In fact, it's so heart-wrenching, Eli, the priest of this tabernacle, actually confuses her for being drunk because she's just praying this so desperately that words, her voice isn't even coming out of her mouth. Her lips are moving, but there's there's no voice coming out. And, And he approaches her and he says, how long are you going to be drunk? And she says, I'm not drunk. I'm just so desperate for a child. I'm I'm pouring my heart out to the Lord. And so Eli, the priest, he says, may God bless you. May he grant your prayer. And so their family travels back home. And sure enough, Hannah is able to get pregnant and have a child. And so a year later, she and her family return to the tabernacle. And this time, she has a baby boy with her, Samuel. And she sees the priest and she asks him, do you remember this conversation we had a year ago? Well, here's my son, Samuel. And Hannah explains that she made this vow with God that if you bless me with a child, I'll turn him over to the Lord for all the days of his life. And she leaves Samuel at the tabernacle with the priest. Now, I feel like we should just pause here because I want to clarify something. I love your kids, but we're not encouraging parents to leave their kids here to be raised, okay? So I don't want to go home with like 37 kids or something this afternoon. So Samuel ends up being raised by Eli. And Eli, another thing you should know is that Eli has two sons of his own, Phineas and Ferb. (laughs) Actually, Phineas and Ferb are from a kid's TV show. And Eli actually has Phineas and Hophni. So while Phineas and Ferb are trying to figure out what to do with their 104 days of summer vacation, if you've ever watched it, Phineas and Hophni are actually up to no good. They, they get into a lot of trouble, and assisting the priest, what they would do is, in those days, it was customary for people to come and give their sacrificial offering to the Lord, and what they would do is they would put it in a kettle or a pot and burn the fat off of it, boil the fat off of it, and the priest could stick in a three-pronged fork, and whatever would come up would be the priest's share, and that was sort of God's way of taking care of the priests. Well, Phineas and Hophni... What they would do is when people would bring an offering, they would just say, give us your offering. Just give us whatever we want. And if they'd say, you know, aren't you supposed to boil this? And they say, no, just give us what we want or we're going to take it by force. So they had these unhealthy behaviors going on. And on top of that, they were sleeping with women who stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. So there's some really bad stuff going on. And God is going to bring some judgment on them. So that's something we're going to know for this story. So the story where we see Samuel hear God's voice, it starts one night when Eli is laying in his usual place. It's bedtime. It says the lamp of God is burning. It's, it's almost out but it's burning, and it was the priest's job to light the lamp of God, and that would be lit throughout the night. So this is deep into the night. And it also says that Eli, his vision is very weak to the point where he's almost blind. 
And as we're going to see, this is actually some symbolism of where Israel is as a nation spiritually. It's looking very dim for Israel. And in what, from what we can see from Eli and his son's behavior, they're spiritually unhealthy. So Samuel lays down on his bed, and uh, Eli is asleep near the ark of God, and Samuel hears his, hears his name called, Samuel. So he gets up, and he runs over to Eli, and he says, Eli, you called me. What do you want? And Eli says, no, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So he goes back to bed. Some time passes, and again, Samuel hears his name being called. So he gets up, and he runs back to Eli. He says, Eli, you called me. What do you want? Eli says, no, I didn't call you. Go lay down. This happens a third time. Samuel, so he runs to Eli. The third time, Eli realizes that there's something going on. And in verse 8, we read, we read, A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And that's when God delivers some pretty heavy news to Samuel. And so the next morning, Eli and Samuel wake up, and Samuel's got this bad news for Eli. And he's not really excited about sharing it. And so Eli ends up having to kind of track him down, and he says, tell me what the Lord said, and if you leave anything out, may the Lord deal with you severely. So Samuel tells him word for word what God said, and it's not good. And Eli actually receives it pretty well. He says, you know, if this is the Lord's will, then that's let the Lord do what he wants. So there's several things that we can learn from this passage of Scripture that I want to dive into. And I think there's three steps that will help each of us learn how we can better hear God's voice in our life. So the first thing we can learn is that we need to be in God's presence. In order to hear His voice, in order to better hear His voice, we need to be in God's presence. Now, this might seem like an obvious thing, but in the Old Testament times, God revealed himself in specific locations. So the ark of God was in this tabernacle, and people would have to travel there. Or you may remember other stories where God was in a cloud or a fire. God tended to reveal himself just in specific locations. For us, since Jesus came, that's different. And the challenge that people had in the Old Testament was they would have to travel to a specific place, Our challenge is that we need to learn to make space for God. It's very easy for us just to go on with our busy schedules and forget to just pause and be in God's presence. But that's things like Sunday mornings coming together in a worship environment like this. That's how we come into God's presence or just driving along in your car and talking to God then or getting on your knees before bed, spending time in family devotions, just throughout your day, making sure that you create space for God to be in his presence. So that's the first thing that we can learn. The second thing is that we need to be ready to hear. Be ready to hear. Eli tells Samuel, the next time you go lay down, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And I think that's another challenge for us. I know for me in prayer time, it's very easy to just go through a list of things that I want to tell God about. Hey, these are the things that could be better. These are the things that I would love to see happen, praying for different people. And I need to remember to just sit and listen to what God wants to say back to me. We're so fast-paced. We need to just take time to listen. Now, it's really interesting to me with Samuel, Eli doesn't, even, Eli, Eli doesn't even call him, and three times Samuel runs to go see him. I know in our house, it usually takes three or four times for me to call my kids before they come, right? But 
for Samuel, he shows up where he needs to be, and he says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, one thing that might be helpful is anytime you're just in a situation, you come in on a Sunday morning and you sit ready to hear a message, or you're worshiping God, just to say those same words that Samuel said. Speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. I'm ready to hear what you have to say to me. The third thing we see is that we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient. Samuel receives some pretty heavy news from God. And commentators think that he's a 12-year-old boy when this happens. And I know a lot of times when I think of wanting to hear God's voice, what I hope is that it's this comforting thing that just encourages me, you know, it's just this personal, warm, loving voice or word from God. And that's not what Samuel receives. He receives some heavy news. And, and we talked about the symbolism, how Israel is at this low point. They're at this low point in the religious and social life of Israel. And God's word to and through Samuel was not a word of just personal comfort, but of social transformation. God's about to completely change how Israel works. He's about to bring a new king, their first king. And this is necessary for this kind of this spiritual decline that they're in. So it's so interesting to me that this is a 12-year-old boy that God uses to bring social transformation. All of these things happen through Samuel. Samuel for Israel was a world changer. And when I look up at the wall here, these are the names of kids who have attended here over the last year. There's around 300 kids that we've had the opportunity to invest in. And I think it's, it's easy to, just to think, oh, they're cute, right? They can, they can go to their classroom and learn a little bit about God. I think when God looks at these kids, he sees world changers. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. All right, now I want to share one more thing, one key observation, one truth here. And the thing I want to highlight here is that God calls Samuel multiple times before Samuel answers. He keeps calling Samuel until Samuel hears his voice. God never gives up on us. God never gives up on us. So maybe you're a parent here this morning. Maybe you're like Eli, and some of your kids, they're like sold out for God. And some of your kids have gone astray a little bit. What I want you to know is that God does not give up on them. He will keep calling their name until they hear his voice. That's so important. That's such good news. So, I want to give you a little bit of a, a behind-the-scenes look at message preparation, what it looks like for me. And um, so, for me, I think when we dive into the text like this, there's a lot of um, great insights that we can, can gain. So, here we can learn, here's three great steps when we look at Samuel's life, how we can hear God's voice in our life. And those are great things, and those are things that we want to practice. The challenge is this can just become a behavioral change. And you can walk away from this place, and you can go home, and you can, and you can have these things down. You can have these three steps down, and you can feel like, you know what? I got this. I can hear God's voice in my life. I feel him working in my life. I'm a great Christian. And it's very easy to kind of almost slip into this pride thing. You know what? I'm doing good. Or maybe you go home and you, or you think back on your spiritual life and you're like, you know what, I always struggle to hear God's voice. I wish it came like Samuel, but it doesn't. And you feel like you're just not good enough. So the challenge, like we definitely want to learn and glean from the text, but if it just becomes a behavioral thing, it can lead to one of those two things, pride or not feeling good enough. So I feel like when I share a message the thing that could make it life-changing 
is when I can find the thread that leads to Christ as the answer. When Jake was just a little guy in Sunday school classes, and I had the chance to teach or be in the room, um, I realized pretty early that he was really bright, and he knew, like, he knew a lot of the answers. So he'd be sitting in a classroom, and someone would ask him, uh, who died on the cross? And Jake would say, Jesus. And they'd say, who lives in your heart? And Jake would say, Jesus. You're like, who turned the water into wine? Jesus. I'm like, man, this kid is smart. And then they would say, um, who did God talk to from the burning bush? And he'd say, Jesus. We're like, no, no, that wasn't Jesus. <laughs> or like, who brought two of each animal onto the ark? And he'd say, Jesus. We're like, no. And I realized Jake knew that most of the time the answer was Jesus. And if he just, just said Jesus, he'd get it right. I'm like, oh, that's kind of clever. But, but he's actually on something because the truth is Jesus should be the answer. That's the thread that we want to find. It's not just about trying harder. It's not just about getting things right and then you feel great. The answer is Jesus, because here's what happens when Jesus is the answer. We don't feel pride because we know we're all sinful and Christ died for us. So Jesus is the only perfect person. He's the perfect priest. So that removes our pride. But we don't feel like we're not good enough because Christ died for us. He loved us so much, he was willing to die for each and every one of us. And so our motivation to hear God's voice now comes out of our love for Jesus, knowing that he loves us, knowing that he died for us. And it's not about me being good enough or getting it right. I just want to hear God's voice because I want to be closer to Christ. So that's where we have the chance to have life change, when we can pull that thread and find it. Now, the reason why I'm sharing all of this with you is because as parents in the room or grandparents or people who serve in kids' ministry or if you have nieces and nephews, you are that thread. You need to be the thread that points to Christ. So rules are great. Like, I'm not saying throw out rules at home. I think the Bible is full of rules, but they're loving rules, and the motivation for following them is because we love Christ and what he did for us. But we need to be that thread and point our kids to Christ. Let me give you a couple examples of what that looks like. So let's say your son or daughter or your niece or nephew, they're feeling really anxious about something, right? They're, feel, they're having a hard time. They're really worried. I think that many times we get worried because of listening to different voices. Maybe if they have a new teacher at school, they heard some kids say, oh, she's mean, you're not going to like her. Or, you know, they're, they're worried about a test coming up, and they hear the voices in their own head, and they tell themselves, oh, you're going to bomb this, you're not good enough, you always do bad at math. The voice that we want our kids to listen to is Jesus, right? We want Jesus to be the strongest voice in their life. And their worth is not based on how good of a student they are. Their worth is based on Christ's love for them. So Jesus is the answer. Another example is homework. How many of you have kids who, like, can't wait to do their homework? They just eat it up. They love it. You're like, where'd they go? They must be doing homework again, All right? So when your kids are having challenging time, they don't want to do homework. They don't want to put best forth their best effort. You can let them know that God has a plan for their life. And you know what? And when you discover what that plan is and when God is ready for you to step into that, I want you to be fully equipped. I want you to be able to enjoy everything that God has planned for you. And so there's a chance that what you're learning right now may help you in that situation, and I don't want you to feel like you can't handle God's plan. Or maybe, maybe it doesn't include pre-algebra or spelling, but you know what? You're learning to have a good work ethic so that you can put all you can into everything you do as if you're doing it for the Lord. And then when you step into God's plan for your life, you're going to experience it to the fullness. All right? Try that out with your kids. Another example what if your child's been bullied or hurt? How do you handle that? There's someone who is beaten 
who is mocked, who is spit on, who is whipped, who died on the cross for us. He knows what it's like to go through that. And the reason why he went through that is so that you never have to be alone. He loves you that much. So I know this stinks right now. I know you're being bullied. I know you maybe lost a friend. But you're not alone because Christ loves you so much. He went to the cross for you. Right? So Christ is the answer. So sometimes these come hard. But what I want you to think about is the next time you're pouring into a young child's life, how do you find that thread? How do you be the thread that leads them to Christ? Would you bow your heads with me? Our kids are going to be coming back in for a closing song. But I just want to share something with you as we close. The story of Samuel goes on. If you read the rest of the book, through Samuel, God appoints the first king of Israel, Saul, King Saul. And at first, he seemed like a great king, but then he became proud and stopped listening to God. And God said, I need a person, I need a king who will teach my people to love me and realize how much I love them. So he told Samuel, he said, go to Bethlehem and find Jesse's family, and there I will show you the next king of Israel. And so Samuel headed to Bethlehem, and he, and he found Jesse's family. And Jesse had a large number of sons. And so one by one, Jesse presented his son, starting with the oldest, strongest, good-looking son. This has got to be the king. And God told Samuel, no. This is not the king. And he went down to the next son. Surely it's got to be him. No. Son after son, Jesse presented. Went through seven sons. And God said, no, this is not our next king. And so Samuel asked him, do you have any more sons? And Jesse said, yes, I've got one more. But he's just a little guy. He's out in the field right now watching over the sheep. I'm sure it's not him. And they brought David forward. And Samuel said, yes, he will be the next king. God chose David. And as you know, David was known as a man after God's own heart. God chose David to become king because God was getting his people ready for an even greater king. Once again, God would say, go to Bethlehem. You'll find a new king here. And there on a starry night in Bethlehem, in the town of David, three wise men would find him. God called a 12-year-old boy to become a prophet and lead prophets and appoint the first king of Israel. For some reason, God also chose a child to usher in his great rescue plan for us. God has a special place in his heart for children. And he's not afraid to use them to carry some heavy burdens and to do some amazing things. I want to encourage you as you make an investment in the lives of these kids, look at them through God's eyes. Point them to Christ and watch God raise up a generation of world changers. Thank you. We can go ahead and bring in the kids. You know, as they're doing that, let's just close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your amazing love for us. We thank you that age doesn't matter in your plan for us. Lord, as we see these amazing kids, Lord, we just pray that not only would we see them differently, but they would see themselves differently, that they would know their worth in you, that they would become your hands and feet. And Lord, we thank you that they are the church of today. In Jesus' name. Amen.